Good morning. It is just great to see you here again today. Well, I want to wish you a happy May Day, May the 1st. We have made it through the month of April. Somebody said to me the other day that uh, this year, February had 29 days. It seemed like March was about 10 weeks long, and April has seemed like five years long. Well, we're now in the month of May, and I don't know, it feels like a little corner has just turned for us. Today, as well as being May Day, is also the feast day of St. Joseph the Worker, the father of Jesus, a carpenter man. And of course, May Day is also in many countries seen as Workers' Day. So appropriate that Joseph be the uh, patron saint of this day. And so I got to thinking a little bit about uh, Joseph uh, as I was preparing for this. And um, I uh, recalled that uh, thinking about Joseph just before Christmas in a sermon, and I uh, in one of the meditations, uh, gave some parts of a sermon I had preached uh, about uh, uh, Mary, and uh, I had so many positive comments that I thought I would share with you just some parts of the sermon about Joseph, because they spoke to me again uh, at this time of COVID-19, and I hope they speak to you too. And, you know, let's face it, the story of the birth of Jesus is, for many of us, like the rehearsal of or run through of a well-known script. It starts off with the angel appearing to Mary, telling her that she's going to have a child. Well, the second part of the opening act is the angel appearing to Joseph, telling him not to be afraid. How did Mary feel when that angel appeared to her? How did Joseph feel? And quite often, the way we always tell the story, it seems as if Mary and Joseph were just quite content to go along with whatever God had planned for them in this divine drama working its way out in the human sphere. The only inkling of anything troubling is when the angel counsels Joseph, do not be afraid. Sometimes when we read the Christmas story, we wonder whether our faith tradition actually deals with the trials and the tribulations of human life. Do not be afraid, and everything will be okay. And so we have the character of Joseph. And as I said, he's the patron saint of cabinet makers. He's the saint for May the 1st. He's also the patron saint of engineers, immigrants, house hunters, travelers, pioneers, pregnant women, fathers, as well as being the patron saint of Canada, Austria, Belgium, Bohemia, China, Korea, and Vietnam. And I do wonder what the connection is with Joseph being the patron saint of Nashville. Now just... For a moment, imagine being in Joseph's position. He's had several months of planning the wedding with Mary, and everything is going according to plan. All is on schedule when suddenly Joseph learns the unthinkable. His life is suddenly in shambles, his truth betrayed, his future undone, and his insides torn up. He isn't responsible for Mary's unplanned, unforgivable, indefensible, inexcusable pregnancy. Joseph's dreams have been destroyed. He wants to know how this happened, yet he doesn't really want to know how it happened. Rather than seeing Mary and Joseph as pleasant characters in God's story, I think they represent a facet of human experience especially at this time of COVID-19. There's Mary questioning, wondering, how can this be? And who of us hasn't stood with Joseph 
having our dreams and our plans shattered, our seemingly straightforward course in life irrevocably altered. I don't know how many of us have said, oh, gee, but I had travel plans, or I had plans to do this, and I had plans to do that, and everything is just put on hold. So if an angel came to me one day and said, don't be afraid, I don't think I would be quite so accepting. I would be tempted to say if I were in Joseph's shoes, something like, that's okay for you to say. As this story often gets told, it seems as if Joseph has a stiff upper lip. I remember as a teenager, a friend's father dropping down dead on the street with a heart attack. By the tender age of 16, my friend had learned from somewhere the art of the stiff upper lip. No emotion, cover it up, carry it on. Did the angel really tell Joseph to carry on carrying on? Personally, I relate to Joseph and the, this way of getting behind the Christmas story because my style of dealing with tragedy is to say everything is okay and by the grace of God we will pull through. Fear not and carry on. Well, Joseph could have gone ahead with his original plan and he could have quietly broken off the engagement. I'll bet he was a cautious and careful guy. Carpenters aren't usually considered to be thrill seekers. Measure twice, cut once is the rule for carpenters, isn't it? When this story describes Joseph as just and righteous, we can picture an earnest, meticulous craftsman who carpentry business is all the excitement he wants. At this point, maybe Joseph represents the established order or the order we would like to have in our lives or the life we had before COVID-19. For Joseph, the long expected Messiah is coming pretty fast. He's being asked to assume responsibility for a girl and her baby with only an angelic voice in a dream to go on. Leaving Mary is probably the reasonable thing to do. He could have ignored the angel's whisper. Even if he could convince himself to believe Mary, no one else will. He could just dismiss the dream and walk away. Who of us hasn't forgotten our nighttime dreams that seemed even more plausible than this one? Right at this moment, it is all up to Joseph and how he will act. I wonder if the question being asked here of the reader is something like, how does one authentically act when faced with something terribly huge and terrifying in life? How does a person land in the midst of what is tremendous turmoil? So I would encourage you as you listen to this, just to set aside the interpretation of the birth of Jesus story that perhaps you were handed in Sunday school seen in most of our pageants, and come to it as an adult and see it as something which seeks to address the human condition. The story of Joseph picks up in the chap first chapter of Matthew after we've had the genealogy of Jesus, or as they are sometimes called, the begats. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, all the way down to Joseph, who begat Jesus. Genealogy comes from Genesis. It talks about the beginning. The writer of the Gospel of Matthew is saying that this is the beginning of something new. With Jesus, something new is happening. We don't read these genealogies in church because they sound rather boring and repetitive. They're generally patriarchal in nature. However, Matthew flips this one on end and includes four women. 
These four women aren't even virtuous women in the eyes of the Jewish tradition. They're Gentiles, and they're involved in incest, prostitution, and adultery. Mary, too, is included, and depending on the way things could go, she might be stoned. This is a revolutionary backdrop to the story of the birth of Jesus. The genesis of Jesus subverts all the social norms of the day. What we see here is a picture of Yahweh as a God who is not bound by human structures. We see that this God tends to work in the margins, outside the lines, in the shadows. Cartoons, when they depict God acting, tend to use something like a lightning bolt with a little bit of thunder in the background. And maybe that is how we think that God, creator of the universe, should come on the human stage. We are told that it is not with such drama that God acts. Rather, God enters our realm in the form of a little baby. Yet having been present at three births, I think that birth is the most miraculous moment of existence. Well, can you imagine Joseph? Joseph desperately wants to believe the dream to be true. What kind of person believes angels who come to them in their dreams? Yet God's angels come and speak to all of us in similar words. Don't be afraid to believe. Don't be afraid to walk a different path, to follow your dreams. God's, this God who sends angels to us is the one who just plainly works outside the box of human conception. How many of us seek to live a careful life, a careful faith, eh, perhaps keeping about six of the Ten Commandments, trying to do more good than bad in our lives? What God asks us to do is something more than that. God invites us to yearn after what God dreams for us. Whenever we become dissatisfied or disenchanted with a cautious faith, it is because our souls know that God wants so much more for us. God invites each one of us to stop being so cautious. God is inviting us today to dream and to be a part of God's dream for our world. This morning, here and now, think of your dream, the dream for your life. What are the chances or the stepping out that you might have to do to discover that God is not only our hope, but God has placed that hope within us? I think that the invitation in the story of Joseph is for us to dream of God waiting for us to take one step in the direction of grace and to discover that the divine love is always with us. This morning, perhaps in isolation, perhaps in quarantine, with social distancing, with fears of COVID-19, our God comes to us and our God invites us to dream big. May you feel God's presence with you this day. Amen.